everybody. This is James Lindsay. You're listening to New Discourses Bullets, where I give a bullet point summary of one topic relevant to us defeating woke Marxism. And in this episode, I'm going to continue from where I left off in a previous episode and talk more about the preface or preamble to the Declaration of Independence. I want to stick with the curious phrasing at the beginning. There are two particular parts in the very opening that kind of stick out to people. Uh, In the previous episode that I was referring to, I talked about the concept where Jefferson says that we take these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And we talked about what is meant in the American context by being created equal, equal political authority, equal access to very little political authority, and nothing you can't demonstrate that you should have. But today I want to go further. He says, in addition, what else is a truth that is self-evident. It's not just that we are created equal by the laws of nature and nature's God. It's in fact that we are endowed by our creator, the laws of nature and nature's God, with certain inalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, the pursuit of happiness is perhaps the most mysterious phrase in the Declaration of Independence. And, I mean, perhaps Jefferson was very sagacious and wise in choosing this word or phrase um, as opposed to the origin story of it. I'm not utterly convinced of it because of its some its, its kind of diffuse nature and ambiguity. But Jefferson derived this, sen- this sentiment, this statement from a very similar sentiment from John Locke, which was that humans have inalienable rights, human beings by virtue of being human are endowed by their creator with inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and property. And the purpose, Locke explained, of having a secured right to property is that property enables your pursuit of happiness. So Jefferson very likely would have understood the pursuit of happiness to have been a broader category of inalienable right within which property rights are contained. And perhaps that's true. Perhaps it means that you have your property and you're able to do what you will with it, for example. It's not merely that you have your things, it's that you can use them in pursuit of your own fulfillment, whether that's through enjoying them, whether that's through capitalizing upon them, and when you capitalize upon them, perhaps expanding them into greater wealth or greater building or prosperity or whatever. This, though, is what is declared as a self-evident truth that we are endowed by natural law with inalienable rights to life, liberty, and property. And this episode wants to dig into why. Why those? Why life, liberty, and property? Why are these the, why is this, as a matter of fact, the fundamental core statement of classical liberalism. You can get into all the things Locke got wrong, like the blank slate. You can get into all of these things that the post-liberals like to argue and nitpick and often misinterpret, whether they're woke post-liberals, whether they're reactionary post-liberals, whether they're Christian national post-liberals, whichever ones you want. They all seem to get these things wrong, but this is the fundamental articulation of what it means to be a philosophical classical liberal. That all men are created. We take this truth, this truth to be self evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator, which is the laws of nature or nature's God. We're not going to lay a claim on what it actually is. That all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these, so not necessarily exhaustively, among these are life, liberty, and property. And I'm not going to go with the pursuit of happiness thing. I kind of explained how. I think that that is merely the same concept extended, not just a right to have property, but to use property, as you will, to pursue your happiness. Now, I want to remind you before I dive into life, liberty, and property one more time, by the way, if you're looking for something to do that's productive and useful for fighting the woke, this is something you can do. You don't have to agree with my interpretations, by the way. You can study the founding documents for yourself with others, with children, with young people, with teenagers. We're not getting this kind of education right now. You can get together. You can create reading clubs. You can do it independently. You can start writing a blog, keep a sub stack, make videos. 
going through the original founding documents of the American experiment and understanding clearly what we're trying to preserve and rescue from the ravages of woke Marxism. And what we are ultimately trying to preserve boils down to that statement. And in particular, the fact that they are trying to abrogate our inalienable rights. They're trying to alienate inalienable rights, which means they are fundamentally in the wrong. Oh, those rights are, or include, I should say, not are, life, liberty, and property, and its use in the pursuit of happiness, or flourishing, or prosperity, or whatever it is that we believe leads us in that direction. And the question is why those particular inalienable rights? Why do we have a right to life, liberty, and property? Now, we can say that we can kind of get philosophical or metaphysical and say that as an individual person, as a, as a sentient um, being that's not sentient even just the way that the, the animals are, but rather with the faculty for reason that we definitely cannot, the, the, essentially what it boils down to is that nobody, we don't have an you know, a perfect right to life. We have an inalienable right to life, uh, which means no human being, including ourselves, has a right to take our lives from us. That's what it means. Inalienable rights are rights that can neither be taken from you nor given away. So we cannot be deprived of our life. Nobody has the authority, the necessary, to take our life away from us because of our standing as a human being, which means a, uh, a creature that is fully equipped with capabilities for reason, for understanding the world around him and himself and his place in that world. This is something that is fairly unique to humans. It may be entirely unique to humans. In the Christian worldview or the religious worldviews often, it's in, in fact said that this is what makes humans uniquely different from animals, is that we were created in this way in the image of God. So we have this inalienable right to life. We could get, this is the metaphysical argument. I want to get to the practical argument, but let's do the others. What about liberty? Well, we are ultimately free individuals. What person could lay a claim on taking away our liberty, our ability to be free, to move about, to do as we will? Who could claim that? And the answer is nobody, really, with one exception. In the liberal system, because we know that people will misuse their liberty to injure the liberties or lives or property of others, we have to come up with some kind of a system, largely a criminal justice and penal system, to deal with violations of these laws, because the role of the government is to secure those rights, and they can't be secured if we allow, say, criminals or monopolies or tyrannical government entities to bulldoze them. And so what we have to do is we have to come up with a system that we've done in the West, which is called the rule of law. The law is not a man. The law is created by men. It is changeable by men, but it is not man. And in the end of the day, everybody has to be bound by the law. That allows when you have violated the law, which is supposed to reflect these inalienable rights, and that's how our system is created, when you have violated the law and thus violated somebody else's inalienable rights, you can be held to account for that by the law, and that's part of the system. But other, other than that, nobody has political authority. The people given political authority to take our liberty in these contingent circumstances are in fact there with our consent under our system. And the third is this pursuit of happiness, or really property with its use in the pursuit of happiness that um, is so mysterious. But this it's the same thing. Nobody has the right to come lay a claim on somebody else's stuff. Whatever it is that made that stuff yours, that gave you a legitimate claim on ownership, nobody else has the authority to just sweep in and, and, and alienate that right, to abrogate it and take it from you. Very simple. Okay, so what practically is going on here? Well, this is a country founded on the fundamental idea that we are free people, that we are individuals with our own minds, our own capacity for reason, our own ability to navigate the world as limited, as flawed, as fallen, as clumsy, as stupid as that might be. And that no other authority has the ability to speak into that or step into that or fight into that or force into that and control our own destinies. So as such, and in particular, you have to be able to reason with the world 
as well as you can. You see, all men are created equal. And what did we say that that means? All men are created equal means that we're all created equal in our capacity to understand, to, to, to use our faculties for reason, our senses, our labor, our efforts to understand and, 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 and operate in the world around us. And therefore, we have to be able to be, work out things for ourselves. We have to be able, and in particular, if you're religious, which was a big issue at the founding of the United States, religious liberty is in fact probably the founding reason for the American experiment, whatever the revisionists in the Christian nationalist camp want you to believe by misappropriating a quote from John Adams. Religious liberty is huge. And this is a very serious issue. But the idea is that if a king, let's say King George or King Fauci or King Biden or something like this or King Obama or somebody, maybe King Trump, who knows, if an authority could step in and take away your life or your liberty so they could kill you or jail you or your property or your ability to use your property as you will in the pursuit of happiness then they can control how you think, believe, and act. You are no longer a free person. So you are no longer a person who is created equal because you are now subject to the people who can control you. And that violates your fundamental inalienable rights, according to the axiom of classical liberalism. So practically speaking, they can control your belief, they can control your thought, they control your speech, they can control your action like we see in every totalitarian state and authoritarian state that's ever existed if they can deprive you of these inalienable rights. So the practical argument, not the metaphysical argument, that they don't have authority because where did that authority come from, blah, blah, blah. That authority maybe is only vested in God if we want to get theological, blah, 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 blah. That's not the point. Practically speaking, the people who wrote down the axioms of classical liberalism and Thomas Jefferson, who wrote the Declaration, wrote it into the preamble of the Declaration of Independence, understood very, very clearly that if you can be deprived of your life by some external authority, you can be deprived of your liberty by some external authority, or you can be deprived of your property and its use in the pursuit of happiness by some external authority, then you are not a free individual. You are in chains. You are a subject to them, which is what they were rejecting. If we accept the axiom, this has to be the case. Therefore, the rights to life, liberty, and property and its use in the pursuit of happiness are inalienable. Now, this is obviously, therefore, what collectivists have to attack. They want to attack your right to life, but by the time they do that, we recognize that they are far, far, far over their skis in terms of how much power they're using. So they can't use that immediately. They would like to use your... Uh, they would like to deprive you of your your right to liberty in 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 free countries they can't easily do this either they can't simply start jailing political dissidents or whatever although we're now encroaching into that soft level of totalitarianism people are being jailed for hate speech people are being jailed for incorrect opinions people in Ireland for example are now being surveilled in terms of what's on their phone and can be held to criminal charges for it which is alarming if it's misinformation or disinformation. Obviously, the J6 prisoners and some of the things that are happening with people in Trump's orbit are political persecution, which is all in violation of this fundamental concept of violating people's liberty. But if we look to a harder but not fully totalitarian circumstance like we see in China, then there are harder totalitarian systems than China. Stalin had one, for example. Hitler had one. Mussolini had one. Uh, there are harder ones than the one we see in China. Although the one in China is pretty hard, we now see this idea of using a social credit score to limit your capacity to do things. Uh, we're seeing the building of these kind of 15-minute city or neighborhood uh, surveillance blocks where you can't leave without passing through a turnstile, and the turnstile doesn't let you through unless you look into a camera, have your face scanned, and smile for the government. They actually say that, smile for the government, and make you smile, and then it takes your picture, and then it knows where you are. In other words, it's tracking your movement. And so people's rights to liberty are being curtailed under that totalitarian state. And those people are no longer free. Those people are much less free than people even in the soft totalitarianism of the West, particularly countries like the UK and uh, Canada and Ireland. Um, so 
these are kind of pictures of totalitarianism depriving you not of life because it's very hard for them. They can do that and will eventually. Mouse head power flows from the barrel of a gun. But here, liberty is being infringed upon. But the easiest one to infringe upon is rights to property and, in particular, its use in the pursuit of happiness. So I'll just point out that BlackRock, or sorry, not BlackRock, the World Economic Forum had a had a symposium or an interview some maybe two years ago, and they had this large CEO of a European company whose name I can never remember, unfortunately. But this is a genuine quote. It's actually on video. We could dig it up and find it. And what he says is that the goal is, that what they realized is that most people don't want the product itself that, say, a corporation produces. They want the benefit of the product. So if they can retain ownership rights to the product and sell you the benefit of the product, then you get what you want and they get to retain ownership. So you actually will, in the words of the World Economic Forum, own nothing and be happy because you get all the benefits of the products. You just don't own any products. But the problem is, so everything, what does it look like in practice? Everything is rented or by subscription is what that looks like. You don't own a car. You call a car service, all the cars are owned by somebody else, and it works maybe like Uber, and somebody or the car itself drives you around, but you don't actually own that car. Well, it turns out that that car might only take you places that are approved by whoever does own the car, or by whatever system, and whatever corrupt systems it's connected, that company is connected to, or that individual is connected to, it'll only take you those places. So you don't actually have liberty. You can't go when you want to, you have to go when the cars are available and on the car schedule, which might be very uh, convenient or it might actually just start to do like every service that has monopoly power and become very inconvenient, making you wait for, you know, schedule hours or days in advance to get a car to take you to a very limited number of places that have to be approved according to your social credit score. So your ability to use your property basically vanishes. They're moving, they're talking now about moving into a car sharing model that people won't be allowed to own their own vehicles, but there'll be a car sharing model. Many people will share the same vehicle that will be collectively owned by them. And so you're going to have to share ownership rights. And guess, guess what? There's going to have to be systems and all these kind of policies, et cetera, that manage, figure out and, and tally up who gets to use it when and how. So this is the idea. So you have subscriptions for your movies, subscription for your music. You don't own any of this stuff anymore. You used to have tapes, you used to have CDs, etc. You don't have any of these things anymore. You used to be able to have an MP3 player and have MP3s. I guess you still can, but most people use streaming services. You don't own anything. Well, imagine that for cars. Imagine that for virtually every hard good. Uh, you don't need to own, say, a washing machine. There's a laundromat that you can go to, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you can have your property rights abrogated that way. And in fact, your use of your property. And the ESG scam on large scale is already this fully implemented. It may not be trickled down to you with social credit score limiting how you can use your property, not only where you go, but how you can. So you have money, you can't buy a plane ticket because you said a bad thing about Joe Biden. Or you have money, but you can't buy meat because you already have, have too much meat in the, this year. And so you're only allowed to have like three pieces of beef a month or whatever or a year, and you've already used them up. So they're limiting what you can do with your property. These are kind of social credit kind of programs, programmable currency kind of programs. But the ESG program at the level of corporations is basically already fully implemented. And corporate owners really should recognize this because they are not allowed to do with their property as they want. They are not allowed to use their property in the pursuit of happiness. Shell Oil cannot use its uh, physical capital the way that it wants to extract and distribute and refine petroleum or build new refineries if it wants to, or build new distribution centers or dig more oil out of the ground, because that would violate the environmental standards required of their ESG industry. They are not allowed or able to use their property in their pursuit of happiness. It is considered their inalienable right, which by the way, they can't even, at least metaphysically, give away. They are merely curtailing themselves in their own right that they can't even lose. And so the ESG system is actually broadly, you have your company, ESG tells you how you're going to run it, what you're going to implement, what you're going to do, how you're going to market, how you're going to expand, when you're going to contract, when you're going to do this, when you're going to do that, what you can, can invest in, what you cannot invest in, and so on and so forth. It has already stolen your inalienable right to property. 
and its use in the pursuit of happiness. And this will come down to individuals like it has come down to individuals in China. And it will come under the guise of a social credit system with uh, programmable digital currencies, etc., or whatever model they happen to use. But you get the idea. The point of that is, in fact, to abrogate, to alienate your inalienable rights and to trick you through what they call social contract theory with Klaus Schwab repeatedly saying, we're going to rewrite the social contract. We're going to rewrite the social contract. Most recently in an interview, he said, we're going to rewrite the social contract away from an economy of production and consumption and into an economy of caring and sharing. So the economy is going to determine what you're going to care about, how you're going to care about it, when you're going to care about it. That'll probably determine your access. And sharing is going to just be redistribution. You will own nothing and you'll be happy. You will have no property rights. But remember the point. If you don't have your inalienable rights to life, liberty, and property, they can control what you think. They can control what you say. They can control what you do. They can control what you believe. Now, as a last note for the religious out there, because I said the American experiment was founded in religious liberty, you have to realize the fire you're playing with if you think that you can abrogate this right to solve the problem, because you cannot. First of all, it's inalienable. You don't have any authority to take it away from people. You have no authority to bend anybody's damn knee. Stop saying it. You're ridiculous. Okay? You're not going to bend any knees, and if you do, you've become the enemy you think you're fighting. You're not solving the problem. You are the problem. But here's the fundamental thing. If your theology, let's say that you're in this kind of hardcore integralist, neo-integralist or whatever, ecumenical integralist, Christian nationalist view, and you're going to bend the knee and whatever else, all this crap, some of them, the hardliners in there say, you better understand what you're doing because you're, I assume, a religious person and you therefore believe that you shall be judged. And what you are doing, if you don't have... I know you believe you have every jot and tittle of your theology correct because you basically think you're God, but let me just assure you, you don't. You don't. And if you don't have every jot and tittle of your theology correct and you're forcing other people to believe or pretend to believe at least, to act like they believe according to a theology that's not absolutely correct, you're damning their souls to hell and you will be judged. You're playing with fire. Go ahead and do that. Your own theology commands that you are making a gigantic mistake by thinking that you can tell people how they're going to believe by depriving them of their natural rights to life, liberty, and uh, property to be used in the pursuit of their happiness, which means you have to let them believe things you don't want them to believe. You have to let them be wrong and let God sort it out, because if we take a theological approach to this, the issue is between them and God. The issue is not between them and God with you as an intermediary. And if you are wrong, that's on you. That's all on you because you are forcing people to go against what they might have otherwise done with their beliefs, with the contents of their beliefs, with their faith, with their religion, with their conscience, that might actually have got the theology right. And that is a pretty damn heavy sin. But I don't want to wax theological. I just want to point that out. You have to understand that tyranny is tyranny, and tyranny is wrong because tyranny is wrong. And the reason that tyranny is wrong is because the fundamental axiom of classical liberalism is actually correct. And that is that they take these truths to be self-evident. That means it's a fundamental axiom that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator, which is the laws of nature and nature's God, with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and property to be used in the pursuit of happiness.